Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker. I am an author, a speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I'm passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. Ah, these are some of my all-time favorite dialogues. Because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Last week, we listened in on a roundtable talk between Dr. Yeshaya Gruber and Dr. Bruce Chilton. He is the Bernard Idings Bell Professor of Philosophy and Religion and the Executive Director of the Institute of Advanced Theology at Bard College, as well as being an ordained Anglican priest. In the portion of their roundtable talk, which is titled Jesus, Paul, Resurrection, and History, the part we listened to last week was all about the term rap- Rabbi, when was the term widely used? And then they talked about Paul's writings as one who popularized a version of Rabbi Jesus's message. So last week when we finished the conversation, we were actually listening to Dr. Chilton talk about the Luke-Acts composition. We're going to stay on that same theme of Luke-Acts, except now we're going to actually think about how Pharisees are portrayed in that set of of writings and how it's different from some of the other synoptic gospels. Now, I grew up thinking that the Pharisees were argumentative and perpetually anti-Jesus. But when I started really digging in and learning about Second Temple history and the emergence of the variety of Jewish sects like the Essenes, Sadducees, Zealots, and Pharisees, and then when you actually pay attention to the educational system within Jewish communities and the political connections of all these different groups— Well, that just all around was immensely helpful for helping me understand the Pharisees in a much better and more nuanced way. And in this particular conversation, Dr. Chilton not only addresses how the Pharisees are portrayed in Luke, but raises the question of the presence of Pharisees who believed in Jesus and who played a role in the early Jewish church's conversation about what to do with Gentiles who joined the Jewish believers in the church. So lean in and enjoy the conversation. Luke is of a special interest here because Luke seems to break, in one sense, with the usual profile that Jesus and the Pharisees were at opposite ends of the spectrum. And of course, this is such a typical picture within the Gospels. One thinks, for example, of the woes against scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites in the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, This is such a typical uh, feature that the word Pharisaic and Pharisee in English, right, have become negative in their meanings. I mean, it's only really if you study Second Temple Judaism that you come to see them as being an important uh, religious movement. And incidentally, this was one cause of resistance at a time when I began uh, to publish of those in the field of New Testament who saw anything to do with Judaism as being some kind of defense of Pharisaism. There was a remarkable degree uh, of resistance to the kind of work which right now is accepted as being perfectly ordinary. But Luke's gospel bothers to tell us about Pharisees hosting Jesus or his trademark meals, which notably he himself tended not to host, but someone else did, because he himself didn't have the means. They also are portrayed in Luke's gospel as warning Jesus when the governor Antipas, the son of Herod, was reaching out to kill him. So sometimes in Luke's gospel, we actually get a sympathetic portrayal of Pharisees in relation to Jesus, which raises the question, well, then, if it's possible to understand that some of them were at least in partial sympathy 
with Jesus, why is it then that they are so negatively presented? Well, let me go back to this controversy that Acts tells us about in regard to whether conversion to uh, Christianity in the case of a Gentile also required circumcision. According to the book of Acts, the group that insisted that circumcision was required were, and I quote, Pharisees who believed. That is, you had a group who not only was sympathetic to Jesus, but accepted his point of view. We can't say how far, because this is just a fleeting reference. But what we can say is that they're prominent enough within the movement to be an influential group over this question of the requirement of circumcision. Incidentally, that point of view was in fact not removed by the council in Jerusalem. Uh, We know very well that from the second century writer, Irenaeus, that there were a group of practicing Christians. He refers to them, well, in his Greek version of Hebrew, he calls them Ebionites. We would call them Evionim. We would call them the poor. They adhered to the worship of Jesus, but they also continued to practice circumcision. In other words, it's a perfectly legitimate point of view, but once early Christian practice saw the acceptance of circumcision as being obviously wrong, it was a tendency always to portray the Pharisees as being on the wrong side of any particular issue. So I think something that that has occurred there uh, is that later Christian controversies have influenced the presentation of Pharisees in relation to Jesus in his own time. The issue of the Sadducees, I think, has more to do uh, with contentions that existed in the time of Jesus himself, but they are, are in fact, much more limited. I mean, the very end of Jesus' life, what brought about his crucifixion was his action in the temple, and his action in the temple brought him into direct dispute with the high priest of the time, Caiaphas. So there, I think it was natural to understand that group as being in deadly enmity with Jesus. And over the course of time, the characterization of Caiaphas leaked over into the characterization of the Sadducees. Not that long ago, on this particular podcast, I highlighted a different roundtable talk with Dr. Israel Knoll. Do you remember that one? He works at Hebrew University, and he had a new book at that time, which argues that if the Pharisees, rather than Sadducees, had been in charge of the Sanhedrin, then Jesus would not have been put to death. So he would always read Josephus as suggesting that it really was the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, who wanted the death of Jesus. And again, it's all so very helpful if you understand the history and the political connections between these two different groups of people. And so having that previous conversation in mind, I was really curious to hear what Dr. Chilton thinks of that idea. I would tend to agree with that, although... I would also specify it more with uh, Caiaphas in the case of Jesus, and uh, totally agree that Caiaphas saw his own authority as being directly contradicted by Jesus' action with his followers of going into the temple and upsetting sacrificial arrangements there. And it was simply because at that particular time, the Roman prefect Pontius Pilate was at a moment of weakness uh, that he felt he needed to make an alliance with Caiaphas, where usually he had been quite dismissive of the high priesthood. So this brought about this awful, awful enmity between Caiaphas and Jesus. And I agree, I think the execution of James was part of that same contention because it's a relative of Caiaphas who sees to the execution of James the Just. Mm. 
Uh, it is a fascinating development, and it turns out that it's preeminently priestly authorities who are also involved with the uh, prosecution of Paul at the time of his arrest. Now, at every one of those stages, we have figures, Jesus, James Just, and Paul, who did have ongoing relations with Pharisees. It doesn't mean that they agreed with one another, uh, but there were ongoing relations in those cases. And I, I would tend to agree, had the Pharisees been in charge, then those events would not have taken place. And Paul, of course, continued to refer to himself as a Pharisee. So it's a really interesting, uh, mm -hmm. at least according to the accounts we have. So it's a really interesting dynamic there. You know, we were speaking about the multivocal perspective in the Gospels, for example, in, in and we can find this in earlier Jewish literature. We can find it in the Tanakh and we can find it in the Second Temple period, you know, different perspectives about important issues of the supernatural, the divine, and among those topics would be resurrection. And so this is one thing that you point to and you categorize, I think it's five different types of resurrection, uh, resurrection of spirits, resurrection like the stars, uh, resurrection like angels, resurrection of flesh, which I guess means bodily, you know, you come back basically the same, um, and resurrection of soul. So one of your recent concerns, and this is expressed um, in your book, uh, Resurrection Logic, and you have a, an article as well, Resurrection Fallacy. Um, so we're, we're seeing both sides there. But one of your recent okay. concerns is to sort of bring out these different perspectives of resurrection that existed in already prior to and in the first century Jewish context to then try to understand how the resurrection of Jesus might have been conceptualized and expressed. And, and your point here, I think, is that we cannot assume that it was just one of these. We have to consider all of them. What led you to this topic in particular, and what do you mean by considering all of the different options for resurrection? Mm -hmm. uh, what led me to the topic was uh, my realization, oh, this now goes back to the early 1980s, uh, my realization at that time that an argument was being made by some of my colleagues, uh, which was a fallacy, as you refer to the name of the argument, uh, of the article. Uh, the, the fallacy is that in order for any statement to be made about resurrection in the New Testament, it must be that that speaker who refers to resurrection believes in the empty tomb. And so that simply caused me, first of all, to point out simply to myself, I didn't write on this, that Paul has no such reference. And it is only with very convoluted argument that one can make him into someone who refers to the empty tomb. But also what is probably even more important the Gospels themselves do not uniformly refer to an empty tomb. They have visions at the tomb in the earliest of the Gospels, Mark and Matthew, but the women only go into the tomb and find no body in Luke's Gospel. And similarly, there's only a visit inside the tomb by men in the Gospel according to John. So, when you look at the actual range of evidence, what you see is, first, it's fallacious to maintain that you have to believe that in order to speak of resurrection at all. It is plain that the writers of the Gospels and others reflected within the New Testament uh, were committed to resurrection without that view. Then at a later stage, and in particular when I was uh, writing the biography of Paul, the force of his own conviction about resurrection struck me in a way that it had not before, because there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you have a complete understanding of how resurrection involves transformation, and also his distinctive point of view that the purpose of resurrection is to bring about what Paul there calls a spiritual body, that is, 
a body not of flesh, he contrasts it with flesh and says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, a body composed rather of spirit. So here is an example of what I would describe as a more angelological understanding of what resurrection is, which, by the way, is the way Jesus himself referred to resurrection when he said that people are raised as angels in uh, Mark and Matthew, or a angel-like in the gospel according to Luke. And then finally, also in that same chapter in 1 Corinthians, Paul names the differing people uh, by whom Jesus was seen. And I realize that if you look at the way he names them, you can link, this goes back to the work involved in the Synopticon, you can link those names with passages in the New Testament where those names appear. So he says Jesus was seen after he had died by Kepha. And sure enough, uh, there are resurrection appearances involving Peter in the New Testament. And what also struck me is that in each of these cases, we have been missing what for the recipient of these experiences was the most important part of the experience. We have been missing the part of resurrection, which is not only seeing Jesus, but being given a commission, being given an imperative. And in the case of Peter, that imperative is to engage in a ministry of forgiveness, which is commensurate with Peter's own position, since he was himself in need of forgiveness uh, at that time, since he had not been entirely loyal to Jesus in the run-up to the crucifixion. Similarly, the 12, whom Paul refers to, appear also in Matthew's gospel on the mountain. They encounter the risen Jesus. Interestingly, it says there that some doubted nonetheless. But it then goes on to have him command them to make disciples of others so that the whole discipling process becomes a part of what it means to work out what I've referred to as the logic of the resurrection. Uh, then we have an appearance of the risen Jesus at Pentecost. Uh, again, because of the obsession with the empty tomb, some scholarship has not perceive that Pentecost is about what the risen Jesus does from heaven. Namely, he pours out his spirit on his followers for the particular purpose of preaching to Gentiles. Pentecost, like Matthew, gives you the resurrection as the key to why that remarkable turn occurred. Since we don't have anything like uh, Jesus telling his followers to reach out and include Gentiles uh, during the course of his ordinary life. We've referred a bit to James, the brother of Jesus. He's also on that list of Paul's. And uh, James, sadly, doesn't have his own resurrection account uh, within the New Testament, but he does in the writings of Hegesippus. Uh, and so I use those because they show James coming to know Jesus as raised from the dead in association with his practice of the Nazarite vow, which became one of the characteristic practices of early Christianity, and of course with a, was a link with Second Temple Judaism more broadly. The whole emphasis of Jesus presence with the community, on the other hand, seems characteristic of the teaching of Barnabas. And we can see this in the famous story of what happened to uh, two disciples who were making their way after the crucifixion from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and how Jesus appeared to them in both the interpretation of scripture and the breaking of bread. And then he disappeared. Now, all of these different stories, I think, have to be set up in addition to the story of the empty tomb, 
And in addition to stories about the tomb that are commensurate with it, for example, those stories that emphasize that Jesus physically ate in the presence of his his own close followers. What I think is quite important, and this, uh, this also refers to an earlier discussion that we had, is that these differing understandings of resurrection could be passed on by Paul and also by the Gospels with the understanding that they are all referring to the same risen presence, but by different means. They are, as it were, canonizing diversity uh, within the New Testament. I don't know about you, but I've never really explicitly connected resurrection with commission. That is really interesting to chew on for a bit. If you like these kinds of conversations and are not yet connected to the vast resources of Israel Bible Center, consider enrolling as a student. From the comfort of your own home and at your own pace, you can take classes online and within a year or faster, you can earn a certificate in Jewish context and culture. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related.